Hi, I'm Kendra Wild, and I'm so incredibly honored to be here with you all tonight. And um, like Blythe said, I don't have the same lived experience as you do. In fact, nobody has the same lived experience as another person. But I'm the mother of three boys, and growing up, we went through a lot of challenges that we couldn't identify. It was social, it was emotional, it was behavioral, it was learning, it was developmental. And so I know what it feels like to go through years and years of struggle and fear and hypervigilance and advocating and navigating. And it's it's a feeling that I will never forget, even though I'm a little bit through it now. And so um, along the way, I burned out. I became clinically depleted. And so there was another project, which was myself and trying to recover. And part of that process, I started researching and trying to understand what could I do to resource myself and heal while I was still parenting. And so it's really become a passion project for me to share what I've learned. It's almost all science-based. It draws on all different um, areas, all different kinds of research and disciplines. Um, and I'm just really grateful to be here tonight. And I hope if you um, ask questions, we can go in the direction that you're interested in. But I don't presume to understand what you're experiencing, but I think that a lot of what helped me could also help you. I hope it does. So I'll share my screen now. Yes. Wait. And I will say I have um I've listened to the whole podcast series a little easier. Um oh. and I found so much of it. I I listened to it honestly as a parent, well as a parent generally, but also a parent of a child living with serious illness. And I really felt like there was so much in there that applied to our, um, our, our, our caregivers. So I can affirm your instinct there. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I think what's interesting is we all can probably agree that we offer so much love and care and compassion to everyone else. But how often do you um, turn it towards yourself? I think most of us don't. And we were having a conversation about this earlier. Is that some? Is that because we were conditioned that way in our society? Um, is it because we just want to keep trying harder? I don't have an answer for you. But today we're going to say that in order to keep going, to keep parenting and caregiving and advocating the way that you need to, we need to look at ways to take care of ourselves even while you do that. Um, so I want to talk tonight about what could help us cope better. Um, so first of all, is just kind of becoming aware of getting worn down. A lot of us are, um, this is what I call the parental burnout equation. And the way that burnout happens, researchers identified that when your stressors it's pretty simple when your stressors outweigh your coping resources and you live at either crisis level or chronic stress for a long time without deactivating, without rebalancing, you can run into trouble. And SOS I'm using as survival overdrive syndrome, but it's sort of a catch-all for lots of problems, whether, whether it's burnout or, um, or other serious uh, issues such as depression and anxiety and you can even fill in all the rest of the blanks on that but I just think that what happens is I've seen it over and over burnout sneaks up on you because somehow we trick ourselves into thinking that we just have to get through tomorrow or we just have to reach a certain you know imaginary end zone and the reality is that we just kind of get used to running in activation. We can't feel it anymore. And so the key here is to, to, to learn how to, how to understand what you need to get more embodied and tuned into yourself so that you can at least get, um, have a better understanding of your needs. So there's a concept called the window of tolerance that is used pretty commonly now in trauma research, but it was coined a long time ago by Dr. Dan Siegel. And the concept is that when you're in that 
optimal zone in the middle and your window of tolerance, life feels doable. It feels like you can handle what's in front of you. And you might have stress, but it feels like it's enough. It's okay. And what happens is when we're under the kind of stress that the parents like, like you all are, sometimes it can narrow your window so much that it doesn't take a lot to bump you out of there and into this zone, either up into the red zone up there, which is called hyper arousal, where you're just activated and you're right on edge, you're out of control, you're anxious, you're angry. That's often called fight, flight, freeze, but you're up there in that hyper arousal mode. Um, and your body just wants to like run away or fight. It's like you're stuck in the on position. And if you drop down into the blue zone, you can imagine that you might feel spacey or zoned out or, or numb or just collapsed. And so what we want to do is keep that window of tolerance as wide as possible, even if you acknowledge that it's, it's, it's probably shrinking a little bit. Um, we got to keep it as open as we can. So the more coping resources that we can build, the wider it can get. So I want to start with a couple of things. First of all, just to talk about self-compassion, because that is the thing that, that we all need to start with and is so powerful and so crucial. And then we'll talk about some self-care micro actions, which are things that are totally free and doable and accessible at any time. It's really a matter of what works for you. So I first want to start by just acknowledging, I don't, I don't presume to know all the difficult and intense emotions that you're going through, but I can say that we're all navigating or you're all navigating profound circumstances. And when we're struggling, it's, it's really human to get wrapped up in the emotion. And in some cases, um, that can lead to even more self-criticism and more loneliness and more suffering because you start to think, well, how can I love my child so much and also wish I could just give up? How can I, you know, how can I have all these conflicting feelings at the same time? And then maybe you shame yourself for that. Oh, what a bad parent I am that I'm, I'm not doing more or that I didn't speak up or that, et cetera. So I just want to acknowledge that this world is very real and that instead of letting it carry us into that place of um, just really, you know, being hard on ourselves, there's another voice that we can cultivate, that voice of self-compassion, which is way more motivating and empowering. So when I first learned about the science of self-compassion, I have to admit it sounded a little bit, I don't know, like sappy or just, I was skeptical. And then um, I heard Kristen Neff tell her story, which is fascinating. She's kind of the pioneer of um, self-compassion research. And she has a son with autism. And a lot of kids with autism are highly sensory. And her son would have massive public meltdowns and just do all these kinds of things that made her just feel like everyone was giving her the hairy eyeball and judging her for being a terrible parent. And it was incredibly stressful. When she started practicing self-compassion, she realized that it gave her the resources that she needed, kind of the resilience to stay even keeled in the storms and, and face it, face it with more kind of patience and compassion. And what happens is we're all conditioned to believe that being hard on ourselves helps us buck up. Just think about it. You think, well, if I'm, I think we just have a habit in general of saying, if I just try harder, if I were just a little better at X, Y, Z, then, then I, should, I should be able to get where I want to be. I should be good enough. And the problem with that is that it activates the stress response. So when I realized that self-compassion actually is the opposite. So when you're being hard on yourself, you're activating the stress response. And that is help is shutting down your upper brain. It's shutting down your ability to make the most skillful decisions to pause and act in constructive and empowering ways. When you turn it around and, and treat yourself with self-compassion, it actually has the, the opposite effect, which is that it, that it, um, it soothes you. 
and it helps your body feel safer and calmer. And that gives you, gives you the ability. I'm trying to get to the next slide and it's not going. There we go. Um, the ability to face the situation. So here's just a little slide on what self-compassion is. What the researchers found is that there are three elements to self-compassion. The first one is obviously self-kindness. It's that being warm and understanding towards ourselves. When you suffer, when you fail, when you feel inadequate, when you regret something you did, you know, rather than ignoring your pain or cutting on yourself, it's really about talking to yourself and treating it to your, yourself with the warmth that you would give a friend and the encouragement that you would give a friend. The, the component of common humanity is recognizing that we often tend to think that we're the only ones who feel this way, that we're the only ones going through anything like this. And that's, that's a very human thing to do. Um, and what it does is it makes us feel lonely. When you remind yourself that this is part of the human experience, and yes, some people suffer more than others, but the reality is we all struggle in some way or another our whole lives. And that's really what connects us. And just reminding yourself like this is part of the human experience helps you feel a lot less lonely. And that's really crucial, right? Because we, we don't do well when we're alone. <laughs> we, we, we suffer. And then the mindfulness piece is really just about becoming aware of your experience and, and acknowledging it in, in kind of a zoomed out way. I like to think of it that way. If you can look at your feelings and your thoughts and your emotions with just a little bit of distance and recognize, you know what, this is really hard right now. Um, that is becoming mindful. And that gives you just a moment to kind of step back and get the perspective to kind of see what's going on um, and, and it makes it easier to figure out what the next best step is. So those are the three components, mindfulness, common humanity, and self-compassion. So knowing those elements now, we can talk about um, a little practice. You can literally do this in like one minute. And I'm gonna tell you about it. It helped me so much. Um, I'll tell you how it works first and then I'll give you an example of how I used it. So what you do is you can, Put your hand on your heart. If that doesn't feel right, you can, you can even hold your own hand or, or don't. But just that alone right there brings some, some warmth and some a sense of calm and safety to yourself. And then the mindful part, this is hard. You can say whatever word you want. I like this is hard. It could be this, you know, you can swear. You can just say this is incredibly painful. Like this is miserable. This is effing sucks, whatever. And then you move to common humanity. Common humanity is reminding yourself, I'm not the only one. I'm not alone. Other people feel this way. This is, this is human. This is okay. This is normal. It's not normal, but it's normal. <laughs> you can say your own words. And then offer yourself a line of self-kindness. Imagine exactly what you'd be saying to your very best friend instead of maybe to yourself. What would you say to your friend? You wouldn't say, yeah, you know what? You're a terrible mom. You're a terrible dad. You'd say something like, you know what? You're, you're a good parent. You're doing the best you can. May I accept myself as I am? So say something that fits the moment that is reassuring. And it might sound, it might feel actually really strange or sometimes hard to do this initially, um, but it's incredibly helpful. There was a time when one of my kids was completely melting down and, and I literally in my head was thinking, I don't know if I can handle this anymore. I, I'm so done with this and I'm in over my head. And this is, this is crazy. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to try this research that I'd heard about. And so I did it. I put my hand on my heart and I just said, and this was, I knew he was safe, but it was still whew, out of control. And I was like, this is hard. I'm doing my best. I'm a good mom this is hard. I'm doing my best. I'm a good mom. And, and what happened was honestly kind of magical. And I think you, you might want to try it for yourself because what it does is it just somehow turns things around and gives you that sense of safety, that little sense of capacity that you need instead of being hard on yourself and saying, oh, I'm, I'm terrible. 
Um, so that's how the self-compassion break works. And there's another, I don't know why my slides aren't, there we go. There's another way to use self-compassion, which is also fascinating. So we talked about tender self-compassion. Oh, someone needs to be admitted. Should I do that? Okay. That kind of self-compassion break I talked about is, tend is tender. It's about acceptance. It's all about accepting our challenges and our flaws and everything. The other side of self-compassion is this idea of being fierce. And I think about this as being incredibly relevant when you have to advocate. You know, if you're in the, if you're trying to deal with the hospital and all these different providers and things aren't going the way you want it, want them to go, or you're trying to get something insured and they're saying no, or you're, you know, I've been in an IEP meeting where, you know, someone said something to me, an administrator said something really rude and insulting. And I was enraged. Like I wanted to rip the guy's head off. It's that very protective, like mama bear feeling of just, <clears throat> and the power of this ferocity, this mama or papa bear ferocity is that it actually kind of suppresses your, your fear response, which means that you can use it for good. You can use it to advocate and alleviate suffering. So when you're having a situation that really doesn't feel right, or it doesn't feel fair, or you know you need to speak up, you can kind of harness that energy, that anger, and use it for good. And so using self-compassion in a fierce way is really about um, protecting or providing even for yourself, drawing your boundaries um, and motivating ourselves. So the way that this type of fierce break would work is to say something again, along the same pattern. I see the situation and it's not okay. I'm not the only one who's faced this and I deserve to speak up or I deserve to draw this boundary, or I deserve a timeout, or I'm strong enough to take this on. So you can think of a situation where you might need to just use your ferocity and, and use it for good as an advocate. And it actually is very energizing, um, much more energizing than holding in your anger, much more energizing than feeling um, like you didn't stand up for yourself. Um, Okay, so that's the yin and the yang of self-compassion, which is kind of what Kristen Neff refers to, shows you that there are really two sides to this. The fear side is that protecting, providing, motivating. That's It's like taking action. And the tender side is that acceptance side. And we have to have a balance because if you're all in on one side and you're all out of balance, you're, you won't feel great at all. And if you're all in on the other side, let's say tender, you might kind of feel like a doormat. Um, so the, the key is really <clears throat> to use that mindfulness and that awareness to, to find a way to feel a, a bit of both. And that's really, that's really it, that's how it works. Um, I wanna show you one practice that I love that's a very compassion-based practice. You may have heard of it before, it's called, called strong back, soft front. And Brene Brown, if you're a big fan of hers, she kind of made it popular by calling it strong back, soft front, wild heart, which is, is appealing. But this came all the way back from um, a Buddhist named Joan Halifax. And she, she um, calls it a practice of equanimity because it's all about um, staying grounded and receptive during difficult times. And so here's the way she does it. I'm just going to lead it with you quickly, just to kind of imagine when you really want to harness that, that ferocity and the acceptance at the same time. On your inhale, you gather your attention. Here I am. And when you exhale, you just drop into your body. Let your shoulders relax, your eyes relax. And then when you focus on your spine, it's flexible, it's sturdy. It's about your stability and your capacity to hold yourself up. And so that allows you to be grounded and rooted and strong. Say to yourself, strong back. And then 
move your attention to your chest, to the center, soft, warm center of your chest, where your heart is. And just think about where the warmth is in that place and see if you can say, I can open to things as they are. Because this is really about accepting life as it is rather than like longing or worrying, longing for it to be different or worrying about what might happen in the future. Um, so cultivating this quality of being accepting and strong is really an ideal. And it, it can help you a lot just to have these little mantras like strong back, soft front. And that's a great way to um, enter a hospital room, a classroom, a meeting, whatever you're facing, even just your child alone. Um, so I, what I really want to say here that is so critical is that I love this quote, a moment of self-compassion can change your entire day. A string of such moments can change the entire course of your life. This is so true. And what I love about self-compassion is the minute that you start opening to it, it can feel, it can feel a little bit uncomfortable because it's not the way that most of us have been conditioned, but the more you start experimenting with it, the more it might start expanding into your life. That's what happened to me. And that's what I've heard from a lot of other people. So once, once we have um, kind of open to self-compassion and believing that we're deserving of care and kindness, it also opens the door to self-care, self-caring. And I have to tell you last night, just for fun, I Googled self-care and I got 5.1 billion hits. I couldn't believe it. It's like stuff on Etsy, stuff on Amazon. But the thing is like, we need to redefine self-care and realize it's not something that you just go by. It's not really a thing. It, it, it's a mindset shift and a practice, and it's incredibly personal. So the definition I have here is any act that nourishes you physically, emotionally, and mentally. And number one, it's, I really love the quote there. L.R. Nost is famous for a quote where she basically says, it's not me first, but me too. That's part of that fierce self-compassion too, that you need that and deserve that to grow your capacity to keep on offering compassion to others. And then self-care also meets you in the moment. Like if you don't have a lot of time and you are exhausted, you're going to choose something very different from someone who's in a different situation. So it's really, again, about learning to tune into our own selves and what you and your, your brain and body need. Um, and it also counts that it benefits your future self, right? So it's not just, oh, I feel like I want to eat 12 candy bars, <laughs> um, even though sometimes we do these things. Um, <laughs> and I also want to point out that micro actions count because you can start really tiny. Um, but every little thing that you might do can make a difference. Back when, when, um, when my kids were younger and they were struggling, I was overwhelmed and exhausted. And I started experimenting because I was like, I have to do something. Um, and I started realizing that micro actions were the only thing that felt manageable. And so I started reading research and collecting and experimenting with different things. And one day I thought to myself, okay, when I wake up in the morning today, I'm going to drink a glass of lemon water as I'm brewing my coffee. And then I'm going to hold a plank for 60 seconds on the floor. And I did it. It wasn't that hard, right? And all of a sudden I'm thinking, okay, I'm hydrated for the day. And I feel like I activated my core. It was like two things that were for me. They were like nothing. They didn't they, they weren't that much of an effort. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to put these things on a post-it note and put it up on my mirror in my bathroom. And maybe I'll try three things tomorrow. Maybe I'll try three things for a week and see if they're the right things for me. So I did all kinds of goofy things that actually were meaningful. Put a bag of nuts in my purse so that I would have a protein when I was sitting at an appointment at 3 p.m. And and, you know, and the vending machine was looking pretty tired <laughs> um, or take the stairs instead of the elevator. Um, it's, it's really a matter of the thing that you think would fill you and making it so doable that, that you can't not do it. Um, 
And so eventually what happens is the, the more, once you kind of develop a toolkit that works for you in the moment with your needs, then um, you get you get better at tuning into yourself and into what your needs are by seeing what helps you and what works. And eventually you'll have like a whole range of skills that help kind of keep you afloat. So I wanted to just show you some other micro action ideas. They're not necessarily based in self-compassion, but they're all incredibly powerful and easy to do. Um, and, and I'll go kind of quickly because I probably went over my time already, a couple more minutes. Um, one simple one is ground your feet. It might seem like a nothing. I remember going to a practitioner who was like, do you ever feel your feet during the day? And I was like, um, no, actually I don't. Just stopping when you feel like you're spinning and the world's out of control and you're overwhelmed and just wiggle your toes, dig your feet into the ground, just focus on your feet and feel that support. And imagine maybe the earth taking away your stress. That's an incredibly powerful ground, grounding practice. Look, it takes a minute. Another way to do it, to ground yourself when, when you're anxious or your mind is spinning is to tune into any of your senses. So this is kind of a popular practice that you may have seen. Some people call it the five, four, three, two, one. And even if you just focus on one sense, I love to go on a walk and try to listen to every single thing I can hear. If it's a beautiful walk in nature and you manage to get away, it could be like, I hear the birds, I hear the dog, I hear the leaves crunching. And if it's, even if it's in an, a little bit unpleasant place, focusing on one sense can help you kind of get out of your mind and into your body, which is really helpful. Okay. Another micro action I love is that we all know how we're supposed to sleep. We all know how crucial sleep is. And I know sleep is really hard for a lot of, a lot of us. Um, if you can't sleep and we should all prioritize sleep, no matter what you have to get creative with how to get your sleep. But if you can't do that, rest is also really, really helpful. And this is a restorative yoga pose that I love. You just lie up against the wall with your legs up the wall for a few minutes and you can rest your arms at your side with your palms up and just let yourself kind of sink into the floor um, and rest for like two to 10 minutes and just see how you feel. Um, a lot of times I think we think that we need to keep going and going and doing and doing more for our kids and, and you don't. Sometimes this makes you a lot more productive. So I'm almost done. I'm going to give you a sigh because I think this is the coolest new breathing exercise that I've learned about. It's not new, it's ancient, but it's sort of been rediscovered recently. It's called a physiological, physiologic sigh. And the way it works is that you inhale through your nose, one long inhale, and then a second one on top of that, like that. So you've really inhaled. The point is that you're filling all those little sacs, those alveoli in your lungs. So inhale twice, a long one, and then a quick burst one. And then do a long extended exhale through your mouth. So it goes like this. And what they're finding with this is that it is incredibly powerful way to release a lot of carbon dioxide fast. And so breath, even though sometimes people roll their eyes, like if one more person tells me to practice breathing, you know, <laughs> um, but, but the reality is it's the quickest way to, to slow your heart rate down. And that's a really important thing to do. So if you find a breath that you can handle that can work for you, this, this is, one idea, one of many millions of breath exercises, but but I think it's a really cool pattern to know about. Um, and then just in my podcast, I interviewed the Nagoski, one of the Nagoski sisters, Amelia, who wrote a book called Burnout. And she talks about how stress is a real, basically it's a cycle. It's a, the stress response happens. You activate all these chemicals to survive and you run and you run and you run. And if it's a tiger chasing an antelope and the antelope gets away, if you've ever seen an animal escape like that, they go sit by the edge of a pond and you see their body like convulsing because all those stress chemicals are getting flowed through and, and released. We don't do that. It just builds up in your body. If you read the body keeps the score, that's the whole point of it. So what the Nagoski sisters did is they wrote a book 
about all these different ways to complete the stress response, to get those chemicals out of your body. So sometimes what really helps us all is find little ways to release stress from your body. And these are six of the ways which we can dig into if any of you are interested, but or else you can just see them right here and think which one speaks to you. Gentle movement. Maybe you want to do a five minute yoga video every morning. Go for a quick walk around the block if you can get away. Um, hug your pet. <laughs> um, watch a goofy video that makes you laugh on YouTube. Um, write a haiku. You know, um, there are a lot of different things that we can do to just like get it out. A big old cry, interestingly, is, is a mindful cry. It's not about like thinking about all the reasons you're crying. It's really more about noticing like the tears pouring down your face and the snot dripping down your nose and the heat and the cold or whatever it is you're feeling in your body and just crying just to let it out. So I just thought this whole thing is so fascinating. And depending on where you are, see which three things you might put on your post-it note. So just as a quick review, I'll remind you, we did the widening your window and fending off burnout. There were three things that had to do with self-compassion that are practices you can try. The tender one, which is sort of like, this is hard. I'm doing my best. I'm a good parent or whatever words you want to use. There's the, that hand on the heart alone can do a lot. If you're trying to be fierce, it's, this isn't right. Um, I'm not the only one who's faced this situation before, and I deserve to take action. In that case, you may want to hold your own hand or hold your own fist if that motivates you. That's another thing you can be doing with your hands when you're trying to motivate yourself to do that. And then remember, strong back, soft front, which is just a beautiful thing to keep in mind and to visualize it <clears throat> when you're trying to have that, that nice balance. Um, and then these micro actions, build a kit, keep it, keep it really simple, put it on a post-it note, do things that, that speak to you, that meet you in, in the situation you're in now. Um, I added a couple other things on the bottom on this list, which include um, find moments of calm, whether it's meditation or prayer or journaling or just quiet. Um, and looking for glimmers are another really interesting thing to try. Um, and it's very doable. Um, Deb Dana, who's a psychologist, um, who's really focused in the area of um, uh, like brain body science. I can't even think of the word right now. Anyway, she um, says glimmers are the opposite of triggers. They're these tiny, tiny moments of joy, like looking at a beautiful shape that the clouds formed watching a sunset, seeing your child smile, um, any little thing that gives you a sense of calm and inner peace. And um, that's something that we can all do. So every one of these things can help you heal or at least cope in a way that's more resourced so that you can be a more sturdy caregiver and parent and partner and friend and person. <laughs> so there you go. That's that's what I got. Does anyone have any questions? I would, I know that when I sit in an audience like this, the last thing I want to do is get on the screen and ask a question. But if you want to put one into the chat box, we can take this in a, any direction that you're interested in. I have a question. Okay. Thank you, Kendra. That was an incredible presentation. Um, oh, thank you. I've been thinking a lot about this concept of grace and giving oneself grace. Do you think of that as being something different than self-compassion or is it just the same thing, but a different way of saying it? I'm curious what yeah. you think about that. I think um, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, just those three elements of self-compassion are the like the practice of of mindful self-compassion is calling in all those three elements the mindfulness the common humanity and the self-kindness and giving yourself grace is very similar to that isn't it it's just about saying you don't have to be perfect you're only human 
you're trying, you're doing a good job. It is very similar. I guess it's a matter of like, how do you implement the grace? But I think it's a, it's giving yourself grace is something we all need to do more of. Thank you. Uh, Kendra, I'm wondering, one of the things, I mean, heck, I even noticed this happening to me last night. Um, the part of the, the critic, self-compassion is an, is a counter to the to the inner critic that we have on ourselves mm -hmm. and i experience and i suspect most of us do that the critic is a voice so how uh, these are beautiful actions and the, it's the pause and then the do but mm -hmm. how, there's that moment before it's like first we have to sh in order to pause and the do we have to and I think this is where you were going with practice 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 it's first recognizing the voice saying the noticing it yeah noticing there is that nasty self-critic um, yeah that worrier so can you talk a little bit about the before the micro like that that moment or yeah. developing the recognition you're right it's practice but I think um when you start looking, you might be astonished. <laughs> You're like, when I started looking, um, trying to tune into my inner critic, I was kind of horrified at how hard I really was on myself. And, you know, where do we get that from our society, from the way we we're raised, from other people who are in our lives, but it's everything from oh my gosh, why didn't you speak up at that meeting? And oh, you're so stupid that you forgot this. And gosh, I look fat today and my jeans are too tight. And why did I eat that thing? And I didn't even get half of this to-do list done. And can you imagine you, we all say a million of these things a day. Um, and it's really just a matter of tuning in. And the little trick that I tried and I since learned that it's, it's a, it's an actual practice is to name your inner, inner critic. I decided to name her, my name spelled backwards, Ardneck. And I would just kind of jokingly be, be like, oh, there's Ardneck again. And what was helpful about that is that that's instant mindfulness. The minute that you name that, that other unfriendly, unsupportive critic in your mind, it helps you become more aware of it. And then you can get some distance from them and say, you know what, what's another more gentle way I could say that? Um, and, and it's, it's kind of a, a test to try to think of a different way to say the thing that they were saying. For example, if, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't get through one thing on my to-do list. Okay, Ardneck, you know, <laughs> that's that's too bad. You're you're not unproductive. You actually did a lot of other things. Let's think about your ta-da list. What did you get done today? Oh yeah, I sat with my child and held his hand for an hour and I made that phone call to that, you know, whatever. So you can kind of start um, turning it around and you just have to get creative to do that. And the more you do it, the less your heart, you, the less critic you'll have. And I have, um, perhaps from my conversations with you and listening to the podcast and just my other mindfulness practices that I've been doing because I'm older than most of the people on this um uh I have noticed that with practice it does you become more fluid and natural it's just so true yeah um, and I don't think it ever goes away and we're always going to be hard on ourselves I mean you'll you'll you just like people always struggle and then but the key is then to resource yourself again and kind of try to counteract that you know so um we have a few comments in the chat so um, Susan is wondering if the research oh. shows that there's any difference between men and women in the acts and practices of self-compassion. That is such a good question. Um, Kristen Neff's latest book is really more about that fierce self-compassion, and she does get into a little bit of the gender differences. Um, if you were raised as a girl versus you were raised as a boy, there are some dramatic differences. And the interesting thing is that 
you know, a lot of boys are conditioned not to have that tender side, not to show emotion or acknowledge emotion, not to be soft and sweet and compassionate. And so what happens is they end up having less emotional intelligence or less emotional resources to handle things, not knowing where to put the feelings they have. And you can just picture the opposite for women. It's that we're taught to give and give and give of ourselves, sacrifice ourselves, just be kind, just smile or be nice. Don't, don't get angry. People don't like angry women. Um, and so, yes, that does show up in terms of that imbalance. The women or people who are raised as female tend to be more imbalanced in one direction and men in the other direction, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, and it also kind of gives you a hint of which side you might need to be working on a little more. <laughs> yeah, I love the the yin and yang, the bear and the heart with being held. Um, Laura is asking, um, she, Laura, I happen to know is a clinician. She's a clinician herself and a parent. And she's asking about how, how can one, how can she support a fellow caregiver who is not practicing self-compassion and she sees this person in hyper arousal state a lot, which is difficult to be around. Um, and do you have thoughts on how to help a colleague, a partner, a child who is struggling with their self-critic or their lack of, you know, with a small window of tolerance? How do you? Is that that is a such a tricky one. If it's, if that person is a, is a, an expert, a lot of times um, they it might be harder to take feedback, but I don't know, sometimes when you, you might want to model just by talking out loud about something that you noticed in yourself and how hard your job is and how, you know, much stress you take on and how you just realized that something helped you and how activated you'd been and ask her, does she ever do that? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? And, and maybe try to lead it into a conversation where um, you could kind of share your own experience instead of saying, Hey, I noticed you're a mess, you know? Um, but I feel for caregivers that there's just so much, um, I don't have a great answer for you on that. It's, it's a, it's an intense, um, job and it's just as critical for you guys to protect yourselves and have compassion for yourselves because otherwise you won't have anything left to give other people. And I heard Kristen Neff say something really interesting is that we all have limited time, right? You have X in 24 hours a day, that's it. But, but you have unlimited resources in terms of your compassion. And if you're aligned and doing things that feel right and are aligned with your values and your needs, um, you, your compassion is, is bottomless. And so there are some interesting things maybe to think about in, in, in that job too. Like what, what do I need for my compassion to feel authentic and to be growing, not just being like um, forced. There is a sweet spot, right? Compassion and boundaries. They, it's the, the, the. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you for asking that question. I don't know if that, gave you any ideas I can't see the chat unless I click on that button I'm scared I, well, I, I, I've got you covered um so Kathy is asking what it was like for you when you first started to practice self-compassion um and are there any tips or stories that you did not include in the presentation from your own experience Kendra okay let me start with the first the first part of that question is that it felt strange and I'm not a therapist or a clinician, but there, the research shows that if, if you're a person who's had a lot of trauma in your life and you have never really been shown compassion in your life, um, you know, in a healthy way, 
then this will be a little bit harder initially. And they have a term, Kristen Neff and uh, Chris Germer, who kind of are the pioneers in this area, they call it backdraft. What they say is it's kind of like a firefighter who opens the door and boom, they just fed the fire with oxygen. So it, you kind of need to go gently and in just enough manageable amounts, like turn and turn and acknowledge your pain and your suffering in ways that are handle, handleable to you. For me, um, it felt a little awkward because I realized I say a lot of mean things to myself all day long. I'm driving, driving hard on myself in my head all the time. Um, everyone is different. So you may also notice that it's, that it's hard at first or that it feels awkward. And my only advice is that if it's too big, you might want professional help or, or a close friend to talk to about it. And if it's, if it's just simply sort of a little bit awkward, then you know you can handle it, then just, just keep trying until it becomes more of a habit. Um, on the second question, yes, I have a million more stories and a million more little practices. There are some on my website. There's some that you learn from the experts in the podcast a little easier. And again, I think it's really just like, what, what do you need? You know, for me, um, I guess one thing I didn't say earlier is I ended up taking a mindfulness-based stress reduction class online. And then I later took a class called mindfulness-based emotional balance. And those were tremendously helpful. And one of the foundational practices in uh, MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction is called a body scan. And some people that might, it might be too much for you and your body, but if you can do it, a body scan is just literally resting and noticing all the sensations, feelings, thoughts that you have by starting at your toes. Like imagine you're shining a spotlight on your toes and you're just thinking, hmm, are they hot? Are they cold? Are they itchy? Are they sore? And moving all the way up your body kind of progressively. And you can do that really fast or you can get really granular. Um, and if you notice something barking, like something really trying to draw your attention, like, God, my low back hurts so badly, you know, and I just instead of allowing yourself to kind of get carried away in that, you just move on. Okay, well, we're moving on to the chest now. I notice you're, you hurt back, but we're going to go on to the chest. And also if you find your mind wandering the, the practices just to say, oh, there I went again, whoops, back to the, back to the, you know, body part I was on. And what's interesting is once you get through that, it might seem like kind of a nothing thing, but it was actually a really good way to get out of your head and into your body and also a really um, helpful way to, um, over time, to learn to tolerate discomfort and to, and to know yourself. I think, well, first of all, that's a, a wonderful suggestion. I mean, that just, I, I, it's, we can visualize what you just described, Kendra. And it's just bringing up, it's reminding me that, um, you know, one of the things we hear a lot in the parents, people generally, and especially this parent population, the parent population you work with, is like, I don't have time for self care. And I love that bullet of it's not, uh, it's what it's not me first, it's me, not too. me first, it's me too. And mm -hmm. it's not me too, I need to go away for the weekend. Yeah, Which of course, would be wonderful. And yeah. if you can go away for the weekend, definitely go away for the weekend. But what, but what, me too, with my feet up against the wall, me too, breathing, me too, doing a body scan, there is time for that. Yes. Obviously, it's beautiful. It doesn't, these things don't cost any money, and that they can be done in the privacy of your own home or in the hospital room or in your car. Um, and obviously on a walk, that these things are accessible and actionable and not selfish, right? Yeah. This is the barrier to taking care of yourself is thinking that it is being selfish when in fact yeah. that it isn't. There's some huge barriers. I'll just tell you, like the most common barriers that parents raise are they feel guilty or it feels impossible. Like I don't have enough time. It's too big. Um, sometimes our expectations about what we should be able to do for self-care are, are too big. 
Um, that's another one. So I feel like micro actions are a good way to kind of introduce yourself to relating to yourself in a, in a healthier way. And as your life affords a little bit more, I mean, whether your circumstances change somehow, or you just manage to have more time, or you start to draw some boundaries so that you don't have as many obligations, or you can offload to a, a partner or a neighbor or a family member. As you make space for more self-care, maybe you can do more than a micro action, but it's a great introduction. And it and I, I do them now kind of almost out of habit and, and many all day long, lots of little things. It just kind of becomes a habit, which is fun. Mm -hmm. I did um, th those people, anybody, Sarita, Laura, Kathy, do any of you want to share something from your own experience before we conclude? Does anybody want to be a voice other than me and Kendra? I can't see. Her. I will. Okay that i'm joining from is kathy i'm joining from my laptop and my cell phone so i can i end up choosing headphones so i can um block some noise <laughs> my husband is is doing the child care downstairs i just want to add this is incredibly helpful and incredibly timely and i absolutely love the artwork and um i went in on a website and printed out the nice little handout about the 25 Oh, micro cool. um self-care i just love the artwork I, this is one of the best artwork that i've especially in the self-care space i feel like the beautiful artwork really really means a lot and i just wanted to um just say thank you for all your effort and from your like, clearly you have done a lot of research read a lot of books and not only just you know growing in internally but also you're sharing um from from your years of experience and the learning and i'm sure a lot of tears and and then sorrows and laughs in the process and i just also want to just to point on on what we're saying about parents the barrier and i totally agree and then recently i just thought about this because my daughter is three and then she had to learn a lot from school and then maybe this could be helpful for parents uh, initially is if parent can model how to do self care and have self compassion it might be a big motivation for your kids right yeah, and then it might be yeah that might motivate parents actually to do it because i still catch my like my three-year-old like this afternoon she kind of tumbled and then she stood up and gave herself a hug but she doesn't oh. need me to go give her a hug anymore she just like then <laughs> i just verbalize it for her like that hurt mm -hmm. that is sad Good job giving yourself a hug. I mean, if a three-year-old finds that like she doesn't cry, she's like, okay, I'm gonna give myself a hug and then I go. It's like, great. I'm learning a lot from her too because it helped. Because the amount of trips that she goes to the hospital, I mean, really one third of her life spent in the hospital, but she is lovely, she's hopeful, she is like because a lot of this practice, you know, and, and I just really appreciate you give the information to parents it's really knowledge is is power and for her to have that little practice it's really it, it's a spark of joy when when i get like to that. see that and it's a good reminder for myself well first of all thank you so much for you know sneaking upstairs and getting away and coming here and being part of this and like you you made you warmed my heart really because i do this out of passion but it's the most fulfilling thing to see if it makes an impact on people and so thank you for that. And I'm glad you have the poster printed out. And the modeling thing is so critical. Like when you think about it, if we want, if we want our kids to show compassion to themselves and be patient with and kind to themselves and not just give to other people and bend over and give up on all their boundaries, then they will do that if that's what we're doing. Um, so Sarita it sounds like has, better on the right track. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, just saying, Sarita has her hand up. Um, we, before we end, maybe, just, Sarita, do you want to unmic yourself and ask? 
Yeah, I actually was just going to say, you know, kind of the same thing that Kathy was saying. I really appreciate um, everything that Kendra shared tonight. Um, and one thing that I was going to just add to what Kathy said was, you know, not only if we absorb this for ourselves, it kind of radiates in our homes and, and into our children, but it also helps us to be more compassionate to each other. Um, you know, a lot of what Kendra talked about um, at the start of her presentation, you know, I do remember as a new mom on our journey, feeling judged for a lot of the decisions that we made. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, when we show ourselves that self-kindness and that compassion, that grace, um, it helps us empower our children, but it also helps us to be better um, sisters and friends, um, neighbors to, uh, you know, people in my journey, I call, like all of you would be my family. I call everybody, you know, this is my family. This is my sister. I think it just, it helps us to be better people to each other um, and, and not assume that because we're on a similar path, we know what that journey should look like for someone else. Um, one thing that I always say is just because you would have done something differently doesn't mean the way that I did it was wrong. And so I try to use that and share that. Um, I just really, really enjoyed tonight's conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kendra. Wow, thank I really you. I love it. that. Would you say that again? I love that line. Just because. Just, just because you would have done something differently doesn't mean the way that I did it was wrong. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. That's self-compassion. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Well, Kendra, everybody, um, thank you for attending. Kent, Kendra, thank you so much for your time. Um, 